everyone, Cleo here and welcome to my channel and today I'm doing a mid-month wrap-up. So I haven't done a mid-month wrap-up before but uh, I am having a great month of August for the moment so I decided to do it because at this point in time I finished 8 books already so I don't know how many more I'm going to have by the end of this month but I definitely did think like it was valid to maybe do a mid-month wrap-up in order not to end up with a uh, overall wrap-up in the end that has like 16 books in it or something like that just because I tend to go on, on a little bit of a tangent when it comes to my books. So um, just a warning in the beginning that um, compared to my normal wrap-ups normally I do a wrap-up section and a haul section but that will be the structure for my end of month wrap up in this one i'm only going to be wrapping up the books that i uh read so far i'm not going to be talking about the books that i purchased so uh without further ado let's just dive into the books for this month So this month, so far, I've read eight books, as I said before. Four of them were ebooks, uh, and four of them were uh, physical books. And two of the ebooks are Net Galley, Act, Net Galley Arcs, so they still need to be published. They are getting published in September, so uh, I also want to get this out there a little bit earlier in order for you to have the possibility to look out for them in uh, September if you're interested. So let's start off with the first book that I finished this month, which was How He Disappeared by Jing Jing Li. So How He Disappeared is a historical fiction novel. It was nominated for the Women's Prize this year, uh, and it is a book set in Singapore. So it's set we're looking at different timelines, but we're mainly focusing around the action of um, Singapore during the Japanese invasion in um, the 20th century. Um, so around the time of the Second World War. So um, we are looking at our protagonist who is called Wang Ti and she is a 16 year old girl who is living in a small town in um, Singapore and then when the Japanese invade they come into the town and they take Wang Ti away and they put her into a house that is called the black and white house where she is made to serve as a comfort woman so she needs to comfort the soldiers when they return from their duties um, and needs to relax a little bit so as you can imagine this has a lot of trigger warnings in it for sexual abuse for rape for um, physical abuse as well for verbal abuse they are also treated poorly in that house so not only are they uh, abused within that house but also in terms of the way that they are nourished the way that they are um, treated that is also very much uh, going to have triggering contents in it uh, apart from looking at that storyline we are also looking at uh, an older Wang Ti who is um, struggling with opening up about this period in her past so she is in a uh, marriage to uh, a man at that point of her life and this marriage relation is very beautiful because he himself also has um, scars from the war period and he also doesn't really like talking about it a whole lot so he understands why she's not opening up about it um, but so we're looking at her at this sort of relationship at her struggling with coming to terms with what happened to her and that is one of the most like um, sad portions of the book is the fact that she, she has so much shame about what happened to her at that time and people also make her feel ashamed about what happened to her at that time as if she had a choice in what was taking place and then um, tertiary, there's a third perspective and that is the perspective of a boy called Kevin and um, I very much like this addition to this story because it's very much helped drive us through the story as well because we're kind of trying to figure out like what is his relationship to uh, Wang Ti or to her husband what is his relationship to these people that we are following um, and so yeah, I really love this one, I would highly recommend it, but of course, as I said, do be wary of the triggering content, and so if it's nothing for you, then definitely uh, steer clear from this, but I do definitely think that it was very interesting. And so I also very much liked the fact that we're looking at this side of World War II, so a lot of World War II content uh, out there is focused on the European um, section of World War II and that's also what we're taught in school. We're also very much taught about everything that went down with uh, Germany and France and England and those things and then uh, we only see the involvement of the Asian countries when we are looking at like the attack on Pearl Harbor but we're very much glossing over everything that happened within Asia itself at that point. Uh, and that is actually what makes it a world war, the fact that it spreads all and that it was also very much actively playing out 
in Asia as well at the time. And so I very much like that we are looking into that. Next up, uh, the next book that I fit the next book that I finished was White Rage by Carol Anderson. This is a non-fiction book about racism in America. It's very much looking at the development over time of racism. It's very much going back to the time of slavery and then showing how slavery ended, but then immediately showcasing how the sort of the um, repression, the um, keeping down of black people remains for a very long time and how that this, uh, what, how this sort of um, suppression of the black people was enacted, you know, what type of legal structure was helping that. And we're going all the way to present day showing like voter suppression um, because me in my naivety, I guess, I was under the impression that if you get the votes, uh, then you're finally able to enact change, you know, that uh, I, I always look back to like uh, these historic times where people like uh, women or like black people were very much oppressed and then I think, okay, once they got the vote, there are so many changes that are possible. Not that there is this sort of euphoric moment in which everything is fixed the moment you get the vote, but I definitely felt like you have a whole lot of impact possible once you get the vote. But what I wasn't taking into account was all of these tragedies that are taking place in to kind of help, to kind of prevent people from going voting. So um, I knew that like uh, there was this problem in America with like the amount of voting booths in city centers, for example, or in uh, neighborhoods that are dominated by black people versus in like uh, white suburbs and so I already knew about that and I already thought that that was atrocious but there are so many more horrible tactics that go into trying to prevent people from voting which uh, like for me this was very much one of the like most eye-opening sections of this book because I really hadn't thought about that because me in Belgium we have to vote you know uh, in principle you can get fined if you don't vote not that they actually enact that but I don't I also don't think that so many people don't go and vote but so yeah I come from a system where you have to vote you are required by law to vote you cannot skip a vote you really have to like have a letter from a doctor for example saying that you cannot vote or something like that so it's very weird to look at this other system um, and whereas I always thought that in a, the opposite system in which you have uh, the right to vote but not the requirement to vote that one of the major issues is parties trying to get people to vote but apparently there's also this tragedy of trying to keep trying to actively keep certain people from voting because that has a negative impact on your results, which is mind-blowing. Like, that doesn't seem like that, that is the goal of democracy at all. So that for me, that modern section about voter suppression was really eye-opening and I thought it was very, like, that very much, um, like, that will stick with me about this book most, I guess. Um, a problem that I had with this book, and that is really just because I am not the target audience. The target audience for this book definitely has already have, does already have some like groundworks in either racism uh, and the history of racism or um, in like the American system, the American legal system. So it's very much more focused on people who are actually American um, because for me it was a little bit difficult, definitely at the beginning, because I was a little bit overwhelmed with like uh, when we were talking about um, state law versus federal law when we're talking about the whole setup of the legal system this whole um you know legal legal the legal system also works a bit differently in america there's a lot more of this um sort of emphasis on precedence and so i'm not entirely well voiced in american legal system and so from time to time that definitely came to like that definitely worked against me and then I was also being introduced to a lot of things about American history that I personally then didn't, didn't really know about like Jim Crow I didn't know what Jim Crow referred to you know it's something that I heard mentioned from time to time in series but that I personally never really knew what they were referring to and so um, it was of course explained to this book but when we 
went back to it when we got back to it at later points I definitely did have to refresh myself so know that if you have like like me almost no background in uh, racism in America that this might not be the best book to start and that um, if you want to have like an easier start to it than I had now that you might want to try another book first uh, I definitely think that it was I was able to push through it and that I got a whole lot of a, a whole lot of information from this book that uh, definitely was worth Word, that definitely was worthwhile. Uh, I also like that I now finally got to understand some of these things like Jim Crow, like um, what is it, Brown versus Board of Education. Uh, some of these terms that are thrown around in American TV shows and, and movies from time to time that I never knew what they referred to, so that I definitely liked. But so yeah, I very much did enjoy this book, but as I said, it's not like your um, go to starting book for racism uh, and so I cannot give you any recommendations for that I'm sure there are enough recommendations out there already on booktube that you can find for yourself and uh, I will be looking for some more myself to maybe get a little bit more of like the basic information about it um, let's continue next up let me talk about a series that I finished this month and that is the series of unfortunate events by Lemony Snicket I read the end the 13th book in this series so I started the series in January have been really enjoying this is this is a middle grade series but it definitely works very well for adults as well however the first like four books I would say are very much more like sticking to a formula and so um, they get very repetitive they always have the same elements they follow the same structure and so um, at that point in time I was like if this if things don't start to turn around quickly then I won't continue but definitely they did and definitely towards the later books in this series I think like the last four or five or something of this series we're very much looking into like deep questions about morality definitely looking into like um, the fight between good versus evil and how nothing is as black as white as that and how uh, there's definitely this thing as gray morality and how uh, this is also something that will affect our protagonists themselves as they start to struggle with certain decisions that they've made or certain events that they've had a, a part to play in and so I definitely did love that the series went to those places. Final book for me, um, so I was a little bit that let down in the sense that it didn't round off things very well and while I personally don't really need things to be rounded off perfectly for this series I did feel like that needed to be happening first of all because it is a middle, middle grade series and so I definitely do think that for a middle grade series that is the way to go um, so yeah I definitely wanted it to be rounded off a little bit better because there definitely are some characters that I've been expecting us to get back in touch with these characters for a couple of books and while we do mention these characters in this book we don't get a sort of conclusion of what happened to these characters where are they now so um, that definitely let me down a little bit and I definitely do feel like there's a lot of happening in the back there's a lot of things about the initial like fire that are still like left out in the open a little bit so um, yeah for a middle grade series I just felt it works better when you round it off a little bit more next up let's talk about Saga so another series I finished at this point so um, I am up to date this is we are normally midway through the series at this point but uh, I don't have any info yet on when they're going to continue which makes me kind of sad because the ninth book absolutely ended on a giant cliffhanger so I finished volume 8 and volume 9 this month so this is a sci-fi comic book series that I also started around January I think uh, in which we are following a sort of Romeo and Juliet story so we have these two uh, main characters who are from warring races but they fall in love with one another but then um, they uh, are like um, they have to go on a run because people of their respective races definitely don't want to uh, encourage these type of relationships uh, definitely don't want to show people that there is a possibility for reconciliation uh, and so they have to go on the run and find a safe space especially since they also have a baby girl on the way uh, so I would say if you go into the series then definitely pick up the first two volumes from the get-go because the first volume is super introductory so based off of the first volume I wasn't necessarily like 
engrossed. I liked that first volume but it was also just so introductory that I didn't really know yet whether I was going to love it or not but from the second volume onwards I've definitely loved this series. Uh, I love like it has a lot of representation in it to begin with so it has different races and these races have different colors for example. It has a lot of LGBTQI rep as well. Uh, it has um, also it goes into like sort of more difficult subject matter that I don't necessarily always see in comic book series uh, not that I have a whole lot of experience by the way but so uh, for example in this 8 one we are looking at the question of abortion which is handled very well in this book I feel because it is a very touchy subject it's very much a taboo subject and it doesn't reach any conclusions about the subject neither which would be dangerous territory because yeah it's very much going to be putting itself on one side of the debate at that point but it definitely did just showcase like the two sides of the debate and uh, just left it at that you know I'm just showing you like the reasons why people are against abortion and uh, and on the other hand on, on the other hand showing why people would want to make that decision and during a pregnancy as well so uh, I very much love this one and yeah as I said this one ends on such a uh, cliffhanger that yeah I hope for this next volume soon but yeah I don't know I haven't heard anything so I'm a bit scared for how long I'm going to have to wait for this one now uh, next up let's talk about uh, the Nat Galley arc. So first up let's talk about The Seventh Perfection by Daniel Polanski. So this is a uh, fantasy book. It is called Fantasy Mystery which is a subgenre I've never heard of and I don't even know if it's an official genre but uh, I really love this. So this is a fantasy book in which we are following our protagonist who is this um, character who uh, I don't know the official name of the title anymore but basically she has had perfected like the seven arts and so now she has perfect memory and so she is going around meeting up with different characters and interrogating them trying to uncover a truth. Uh, and so, but so on our side we are doing more or less the same because we are only given half of the narrative. We are given, uh, so it's told solely through dialogue. There is no sort of like description or anything like that. It's solely told through dialogue. And we are only given the other half of the conversation. So we are not shown the uh, conversation side of the protagonist we're only given the answer so we don't know what questions she's asking or what remarks she's making based on the answers we only know the answers and based on that we are kind of given a puzzle to solve which kind of having to make like connect those dots ourselves to try and figure out what is the truth that she's trying to uncover and uh, what is the answers that she is getting um, because in no way she's she given straight and forward answers. She's always given like part of the story. So also the answers, even though you're given them, you still need to put them together into a cohesive whole. And that worked very well. And uh, I also thought it was a super compelling way to tell this story because I definitely did flew through it. It is also very short, it's 176 pages. Um, but I definitely loved it and I want to try out more by Daniel Polanski because I definitely did love this story a whole lot. Um, in terms of world building, I have read this and I do agree that that is probably uh, like its weakest point. We don't get a whole lot of world building because everything is told through, through dialogue. So a lot of times in the description we will go into world building in fantasy books, but since we don't have a description here, you can only introduce world building through its dialogue. However, the people that are inhabiting this world, they don't need that world building, they know this world, meaning that the world building is going to be very uh, limited because um, yeah, there's no reason for any of these characters to explain what a certain um, like different sort of race uh, looks like because all the people in that world know what it looks like. So from time to time you're kind of left wondering like you want more information about certain things that you won't be getting because of this structure. Absolutely love it. I uh, definitely want to buy more by him but I'm going to wait until I finish a little bit more of my unread books because uh, I have been buying a little bit too much this year already. Um, but so yeah, this is coming out on I think the 22nd of September. I will flash it on the screen if it's something else. Uh, and I would highly recommend it. Five star reads for me. Next let's talk about 
Tin Man by Sarah Winman. So this is not a Ned Kelly arc, by the way. I'll talk about the second Ned Kelly arc after this one. So Tin Man is a um, rather short novella as well, in which we are given two perspectives. We're given the perspective of Alice and the perspective of Michael. We start out the book with the perspective of Alice, who is this um, somewhat older man, I think like more like in his 40s, 50s maybe, who uh, has just lost his wife. And so he is grieving and he is thinking back of on his childhood, on the time that he spent with his wife. Uh, and throughout this reminiscence, uh, reminisc while he's reminiscing about his youth, we do uncover that there was also this relationship he had with a boy called Michael. So this has bisexual rep and it does it very well. I mean, I'm no bisexual myself, so I cannot fully um, recommend this uh, representation or not so definitely do check out other represent uh, other reviews if you want more info on that but it definitely validates both relationships it validates the love he had for Annie without saying that his love for Annie uh, is more valid than his love for this man or that because he has now married a woman it doesn't it means that his previous relationship with a man was just a mistake or without trying to say that um, he is uncomfortable with his uh, homosexuality, so he escaped into a, f a relationship with a woman. No, it definitely showcases how much love there was in both of these relationships and how valid both of them are. What I also absolutely love is that, um, so this relationship he had with Michael is never really brought to full fruition, and um, so they never really um, announced their, in their relationship to the world. Um, but it's also not like they are high like it's not like Alice is hiding Michael in a closet somewhere as in like his secret past or something like that. Michael is very much his best friend and so when he marries Annie, Michael becomes very much a fixed part of their relationship and they become a sort of trio and I really love that relationship that you had between those three together. I really love that dynamic that worked just so well. And then in the second part we're going to be looking a little bit at Michael because there's this period in time that we learn that Michael kind of went missing and that they did didn't have contact with Michael at all and in that second part we're going to be looking at that. So this book very much deals of obviously with um, like questions of identity, uh, questions of um, sexuality uh, and very much also going to be looking at grief and um, there's also trigger warnings for um, sickness in this particular for AIDS. Um, I really love this one. I thought it was like short sweet but like bittersweet um, and it just had such nice atmosphere and what I also very much loved about it is like all of these characters are very fleshed out. They very much have their own feel, their own uh, voice. Uh, so like Alice is a little bit more of the like stereotypical like introverted Englishman who um, like puts up a sort of like tough veneer. Like, uh, very difficult to understand you know, how he's feeling, uh, what's up in his life. And then Michael is the total opposite. He's very much the charismatic character. He's very much a little bit more like, uh, he's very much a total extrovert. He's very um, charming. And so I very much loved these characters, uh, all of them. So uh, final book that I'm going to talk about is Alone Together. Um, it's called, the subtitle is Grief comfort and love in times of COVID-19. It is an anthology which is edited by Jennifer Hout and it comes out on the 1st of September. Now I personally didn't really have a great experience with this collection just because I feel like all of the pieces in it are just too small for me to be able to get anything out of them. So the main uh, sort of like selling points for this are that of course there's going to be a whole lot of recognition and that is very much what works best in this collection this sort of recognition of situations that you we've all been going through uh, through during lockdown in COVID-19 these recognitions of situations that um, will definitely ring a bell uh, even if like the particulars might be a little bit different and so this sort of sense of unity that you get with these authors because of the shared experience uh, I also also definitely like that we're also looking at like certain situations that everybody knows about that note but that you might not have experienced yourself like the loss of a person for example and I definitely feel like the grief section for me worked the best in the terms of this um, collection 
Um, but as I said, I felt like most of the pieces were just too small for me to get anything out of. And it just felt like we were just getting a series of anecdotes and like there wasn't anything else to it. So except for that whole sort of recognition, uh, for that whole sort of sense of recognition, there really wasn't that much in it for me. There were certain small pieces in which I definitely felt like I liked the narrative voice a lot and I would have liked for a little bit of a longer piece. But so yeah, that um, definitely left me a little bit hanging with this collection. But definitely if you want to read more about other people's time during COVID-19 and their experiences, this can be a nice collection. Do know that the physical book that is coming out on the 1st of September has a certain amount of uh, stories in it, but the audiobook and the ebook will have more to them. I ended up sticking to the physical copy in terms of like what I read. I didn't read the additional material because I had already been struggling with completing the original material because um, yeah, I just didn't really see the point in continuing on because um, yeah, it was just more, I wasn't really getting much out of it, sadly. But so yeah, these are the books that I uh, read this month so far. So we are the 15th of August. I'm currently reading a third Nat Galley arc. So very much thank you to Nat Galley for these uh, reading materials in the month of August so far. Uh, and yeah, uh, I'm also still making my way through The Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Uh, and I am about... 260 pages into this 1000 page book but i will talk more about the count of monte cristo in my end of month uh, wrap up but so yeah um that'll be it for my mid-month wrap up this month uh, let me know down below if you've read any of these books and what your thoughts are on them i would happily talk more about them with you guys but yeah see you guys for the next one bye